boxing, karate, kung fu, kendo, throwing dynamite, whatever this is. In the world of anime, you can expect a lot of fighting to happen. Whether it's merely a show with action, or a show dedicated entirely to the genre, you can expect to see some form of martial arts displayed for our viewing pleasure. Today, I'm looking to answer the question that almost all of these shows ask in one way or another, which is the best? Which martial arts anime can be considered a cut above the rest, the cream of the crop? Compared to something like Slice of Life or Isekai, the martial arts genre actually has surprisingly little entries in it. I should know, I used to be very obsessed with it back in the day. So what exactly is the criteria one should use when making the bold claim that there is, in fact, a best in the genre? What exactly separates a martial arts anime from any action-oriented anime? Does something like My Hero Academia qualify, since they do fighting and some people have styles? Does it need to be based at all on realism, or any of our real-life fighting styles? Or can it make up its own? Does it need to be with humans, or can mechs or monsters take part in it as well? This won't be one of those videos where everyone's a winner, there will be a clear victor at the end. So let's go over some of the criteria that I, as someone who at one point lived the life of a martial artist, used to make these judgments. First off, for which shows can qualify, I'm going with Bloodsport rules, where anything goes. Any show that can showcase people fighting in different ways, whether or not the styles have a name, and the hand-to-hand -hand combat action is a main focus, will qualify. I say hand to hand, but I'll also be including the use of weapons, and the use of special abilities. So something like Psychopaths will be disqualified, but something like My Hero Academia qualifies. But let's be real, it's not gonna win. The work in question can be an anime or a manga, and its popularity will not play a role in the decision making. In other words, something that's become a meme printing machine like Baki, and something that's not well known, without even having an anime adaptation, but still a solid piece of martial arts work like Holy Land, will be held to the same state. Standard. The same will apply for age. A newer piece of work, like Windbreaker or Strike It Rich, the newest manga from the Kengen Ashura author, will not get an upper hand over Ranma based purely on its novelty. No, they'll have an upper hand based on the quality. One of the biggest aspects I will be looking at is variety. This will come in two forms. Either a variety of the various martial arts styles that are practiced, like in Kenichi, or a variety that can be found within a singular discipline, like boxing in Hajime no Ippo. It can also be more fantasy based, or based around a variety of attacks, such as Ultimate Muscle. Next thing to look at is plot, and I divide it into two opposing categories. One category is if the action and violence are the means of telling the story. So in anime and manga, like Hinomaru Sumo, for example, each bout is used to further progress the character's story arcs, and each each move learned or shown is meant to encapsulate something about that character. Or Windbreaker, where one of the main themes is high school students talking with their fists, and the main character awakening to a whole new way of life. On the other side, we have something like Grappler Baki, where the plot is just who is stronger, and any other subplots or whatever are just thrown together to make people fight. Which, let's be clear, a show doing away with its plot and acknowledging it is what it is, is much better than a show that tries to do a plot and does it poorly. When making judgments, two shows of opposite ends cannot be compared to one another for this topic. It's completely an apples to oranges comparison. Something like Tenjo Tenge, whose plot can become extremely complicated with many interwoven pieces, cannot be compared to something like Dragon Ball, whose storytelling is not exactly Shakespeare, even if it has its moments. Bouncing off the previous examples, and this is going to be very important, power levels will not play a role in the decision making. Just because Goku can beat up everyone from Samurai Champloo does not mean Dragon Ball is going to get bonus points. Instead, people's power levels, whatever that might mean, will be viewed in respect to their own show. Someone lifting a tractor in Dragon Ball is nowhere near as impressive as this. <laughs> Finally, the vaguest of criteria, one that I can't really fully explain like the others, and one that would be the most objective amongst people, the heart and soul. What you felt when Goku went Super Saiyan, when Ippo suffered his first defeat, Miyamoto Musashi asking himself what is strength in Vagabond, Yakumo Mutsu drifting with the clouds, the strongest in all the land with no one even knowing his name, 
in Shuren no Toki. The feeling of climbing the top of a very tall mountain, experiencing the sights and feelings that only those who would also up there can experience. The experience that requires no words, but only a look. What shows are able to capture these abstract concepts and use art to communicate them as best as they can to the uninitiated? Before going into who I declare to be the winner of best martial arts anime and manga, we should do a brief background of the man making this video to give me some credibility on this topic, as well as maybe give people a better vision of the concept of heart and soul. Before I even came to this country as a wee little 4 year old, I've had a fascination with martial arts. Granted, at that age, I just want you to know how to do flying killer death attacks and use them against monsters, but still, this fascination slowly turned into a love. It wasn't until I was 14 years old that certain events that happened in my life all accumulated and made me decide to follow in the path of the martial artist. I knew what I wanted, or at least as much as a 14 year old could know. I didn't want to do tournaments or compete for many colored belts. I didn't yet know what the soul of a martial artist was, but I could at least make out what it wasn't. It took me a long time, but eventually I found a dojo that I was satisfied with and began my training in earnest. I took what I did seriously, very seriously. It was not a hobby, it was a genuine way of life. Whatever direction my life took moving forward, it would involve the martial arts. But there was still something missing from this training early on, something I didn't even know was missing. That changed when I went to my dojo's yearly annual event, the Grand Gashuku. What this was, was a six day training event in Spokane, Washington, held by the head of my organization, Sensei Teruo Chinan. He was a man who would eat, live, and breathe his style, just as I thought I had been doing. I thought I knew what that meant, until I finally visited his home and saw what it meant. Much like the difference between seeing pictures of the top of the mountain and being there yourself, there was something special, something spiritual about Chinan Sensei's Garden Dojo that the pictures you see on screen do not do it justice. One of those things that make what you're seeing so special is that when he bought the land, this was all that was on it. And as you can tell, the home is a different because he tore it down and rebuilt it from scratch starting in 1969. Nearly everything was built by him over the course of 40 years. Every tree he planted, every stone he placed. He had built himself a separate private dojo, a tea house, a sauna. It was my first real look into the concept that the martial arts were not just about punches and kicks. And while you would train in earnest to defeat the opponents, that was not the end goal. This man had built his entire home around his spiritual and martial discipline. My only focus at that age was to be able to defeat every person I would fight. But what would that matter if those fights crippled me to the point where I could never practice again? My joy was in practicing and self-improvement, not in beating people. By the end of his life, Chiran Sensei was still training people with a metal leg while in his 70s. That was the life I wanted. I didn't want some miserable life where the point of my work was so that I could retire and then be old. I wanted my life to be one where the concept of retirement was pointless because even with the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, I would still be doing the same things. While sticking with this dojo, I would also, to various extents, expand into other styles from Kendo and Tai Chi to Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. I began doing amateur MMA at age 18. Unfortunately, Despite putting my everything into the world of martial arts, sometimes fate has a different plan for you. On June 19th, 2012, a Jiu Jitsu instructor went too hard on submission and broke my arm. The bone split in two, twisted, and punctured a nerve. The doctors told me, unless I got surgery that was too expensive for me to even consider, I would never have used my right arm again. That was it for me. There was no option B. In one instance, everything was taken away from me. After some time of crippling depression had passed, there were only two options available for me, find a way to get used to my arm again, or find the tallest building to jump off of. I was able to tell from the interactions with the doctors that they were severely incompetent, bordering on malicious. One evidence is that, for this break that you see on screen, I never got a cast. The doctor scheduled it for next week, but he then went on vacation for that week. From there, no rescheduling, no other doctor would take care of it, that was it. All I had was a glorified bandage. So I began to research nerves and nerve damage, and discovered that it was possible to train other nerves in my arm to do the work, and maybe whatever the initial nerve that was damaged would start to heal itself as well. But eventually, my patch recovery began. It took over a year for my arm to be relatively functional again, and it took even longer for the strength to match the other arm. To this day, they feel different, but I was back in my path as a martial artist. I went back to my dojo, 
began training with different people in MMA, I became a personal trainer, using my experience in physical fitness to train other people, including people who were crippled in worse ways than me. Eventually, I became stronger than ever before. But unfortunately, fate once again had other plans. Due to complications stemming from different movement patterns caused by me compensating for the arm, I ended up causing some severe, crippling damage to the muscles in my neck and back. This section is getting longer than anticipated, but to make a long story short, it was evident that I could not keep chasing this path anymore. In 2015, I gave up my plans of making my living as a martial artist, and in 2018, left my personal training job, eventually stopping my training altogether as an hard to focus on making ends meet. So now I follow a different path, one a bit less brutal on the body, and that is with my anime themed tea store, The Dragon's Treasure. It has not been an easy road, that's for sure. Oh god, has it not been an easy road. But the piece of making tea has its own rewards to it. If you wish to support this poor crippled old man, his videos, and his tiny little tea shop, check out my website and pick yourself up some tea, coffee, and now handmade soaps. This is my only means to make a living. And times are tough, so any and all support would be greatly appreciated. And aside from helping me live, you also get yourself some amazing tea in the process. So that was just a small glimpse of my history living the life of a martial artist. And why I'd like you to think that my opinion on this matter matters a bit more than the average kung fu bear. There's no way I can say I've watched every martial arts anime and manga, but I can definitely say I've read or watched more than most. From the obscure like Shuro no Toki, to the immensely popular like Baki, to the more realism focused works like Karate Shikoshi Monogatari, to fictionalized fantasy works like Avatar The Last Airbender. But among all of them, there is one piece of fiction that stands above them all. So much so that I would not say second place is anywhere close to them. A piece of martial arts media that somehow manages to encapsulate every aspect of what one would look for, from down to earth realism to impossible feats of strength. From light-hearted humor to deathly serious moments. From fights to stop schoolyard bullies, to fights that decide the fate of the planet. In the world of martial arts anime, only one can claim the title of the strongest. History's Strongest Disciple Kenichi, or as it's called in the inferior dub translation, Kenichi the Mightiest Disciple, is a manga that ran from April 2002 until September 2014, totaling 583 chapters. Of those, 144 were turned into a 50 episode anime and an 11 episode OVA series. The story follows Shirahama Kenichi, a weak and pathetic school kid who wishes to change himself. Unfortunately for him, even in his attempts to change himself, he has to deal with bullying. His life path is altered when he runs into, and gets thrown by, the new student, Furinji Mew. They become friends, and one day when walking home, he comes across her standing up to some gang members, and weak legs Kenichi, as he has been nicknamed, wishes to run away. The gang members, very conveniently, say some stuff about how the weak will forever stay weak, and turn a blind eye towards evil, but Mew's words light a fire under him, sending him into action. <laughs> Hey, I didn't say it was good action. Mew then springs into action, showcasing her inhumane levels of martial arts ability and sending Kenichi's heart aflutter. Depending on if you're watching the anime or reading the manga, the sequence of events are different, but if you were to stick with the anime for the beginning, and I'll explain why you probably should a little bit later, Mew finds out about his bullying problem and his desire to learn martial arts, so she takes him to her home, the infamous Ryo Zanpaku home to some of the greatest martial artists alive, the 100 Don Brawler and Karate Master Sakaki Shio, the Death God of the Muay Thai Underworld, Apachai Hopachai, Master of all Chinese martial arts, Sogetsu Ma, Prodigy of all martial weapons, Kosuga Shigure, Master of many disciplines, the Philosophical Jiu Jitsu Master, Koetsuji Akisame, and the Invincible Superman, the man who has never known defeat, and the Elder of the Household, Furinji Hayato. As tipped off by the surname, he is the grandfather of Mew. It is from this dojo that Kenichi's life changes forever. Right from the beginning, the variety is obvious. Kenichi himself undergoes the training of five different martial arts masters. Outside of them, the variety of martial artists and styles is greater than any other show you can find. We have boxing, judo, capoeira, tai chi, lucha libre wrestling. Styles that focus on countering the opponent, 
bow staff users. Knight that use a lance and horse. Sumo. Different styles of karate, kung fu, and muay thai. Guns. Three style street fighters. Spears. Different swords either wielded by elegant fighters or angry barbarians. Blind fighters. Fighters in wheelchairs. I'm telling you, this anime hits things you probably wouldn't even think of. Every nation, from America to Greece to India, Russia, small fictionalized Southeast nations. Anything and everything is represented in this show. The main character, Shirahama Kenichi, is one of the best protagonists I have ever seen. For starters, his origin story is the best starting point to represent the heart and soul of martial arts. He is, in every sense of the word, a novice and a weakling. No talents or gifts in the martial arts. He doesn't have a demon fox to give him power, couple one of the strongest bloodlines you can imagine. He didn't work in the docks or practice gymnastics to give him the perfect body before he even starts his training. He wasn't bred by his father for the sole purpose of fighting. What you see with him is what you get. There is no one more than him that can be labeled a true underdog, and we are always reminded of it. Kenichi does an excellent job showing us just what all this training is meant to bring forth. His heart is pure, his convictions are true. He wishes to protect those closest to him and defeat the evils that others turn away from. Unfortunately, those convictions mean little when your courage is as flimsy as jello pudding. But through his perseverance and a forcible help from his masters, he grows his body and his heart to a point where he can eventually stand up for what is right. Indeed, watching the growth of his courage from a man always looking to run away to a man who eventually leaps into action before anyone else is masterfully done, as it is gradual over the course of the nearly 600 chapters. He doesn't one day wake up and have the heart of a lion, no one gave him a power to friendship speech where suddenly his entire persona changes, yet, when having to protect the life of another, he will even stand up against another master looking to kill him. And speaking of killing him, there is no other show that more massively does the progression of threats. First we have the progression of enemies, trying to keep spoilers low for those who have not seen it yet. The first problem Kenichi has to face is a measly bully in the karate club. Him dealing with that bully gets the attention of the captain of the karate club. That interaction gets the attention of the gang leader who he served under, who sends progressively more difficult underlings. That gang leader is actually just the leader of her platoon, and she gets promoted to the top 8 of her entire gang. That top 8 has the original 3 founders of the gang, who are all in a class of their own. The leader of those three is himself part of a different organization, who are an offshoot of an even larger organization, and I could go on. When you say it like this, it might come off as silly, but there's a certain natural flow to it that makes it all make sense. And so, Kenichi's martial arts training has to grow from merely defending himself from some bullies who just want to beat him up to eventual battles of life and death. There's a funny thing that happens when you finish the series and look back on it. In the beginning, when Kenichi is merely dealing with some hoodlums who want to beat him up, there's a lot of jokes about how serious Kenichi takes everything, but how likely all his masters take it. By the end, when you are thrown into the depths of martial arts, you start to see it for yourself as well, of just how not serious those fights actually were. There is a clear tonal shift, the first time Kenichi is stuck, by himself, with no backup, against another martial artist who is seeking to kill him. Kenichi gets stabbed in the shoulder, as he comes to realize that this is not some schoolyard fight, but an actual fight to the death with someone who has both the capability and the desire to end him. I'll leave it to you to follow the story to see what Kenichi does in this situation. Before moving on to the next section, I will leave you with this. The show starts from your school fights, but people do eventually take fatal blows and even die. This includes bad guys, and good guys, and even masters. Like everything else mentioned so far, the range of abilities of Kenichi is expertly done in a way that somehow manages to encapsulate both the realistic and everyday elements of a fight to the almost mystical levels of strength, and somehow it just works. Close to the beginning, when Kenichi goes up against a boxer, his Muay Thai master taught him the best counter for a boxer, the low kick. Through slow progression, Kenichi fights a boxer on a school roof while executing his new technique, the low kick, and eventually progresses to learning Ultra Instinct as he uses it for the first time in a collapsing coliseum. 
On the question of if the violence in action is merely a tool to tell a story, or if the violence is the story, the answer to Kenichi is, much like everything else, both. Every fight is simultaneously a different story that we are being told through fists, and also a spectacle to show off Kenichi's new techniques, or the new fighting styles that we have been introduced to. There is a certain negative element to this, however, as criticism should be given when it's due. First off, the output for Kenichi is amazing. Every panel is great, and one of the greatest parts of reading the manga is seeing the massive Kenichi level improvements in the artwork of the author. While the beginning chapters were, let's just say, not master level, the artwork evolved into beautiful, magnificent spectacles such as this. Every single character in Kenichi is given their own unique look and feel that makes them stand out from each other. Even background characters that only appear for a chapter or two, such as all eight of these characters who are never seen again after this are given love and attention to detail as if they were major players to the story. What was I talking about again? Oh yeah, criticism. While some panels of Kenichi allow you to clearly see what's going on, other panels are unfortunately overloaded with particle effects, to the point where you don't know what's going on. Maybe that's just a personal criticism, but I would have much rather been able to clearly tell what I'm watching. It's not just the output design of the characters, everyone has their own unique, distinct personality. Shows like Baki, for as much as I love them, their fighter personalities can all be put into two categories. Those who approach a fight while smiling, and those who approach a fight while frowning. If you did the trope with everybody body swaps, but all smiling folks swap with smiling folk, and vice versa, you would not be able to tell who is who unless they start fighting. With Kenichi, there is very little overlap with their personalities. This difference in characters is showcased to us beautifully in probably the most hype moment of the anime, when Kenichi is rendered unable to use his normal way of fighting so he has to resort to mimicking his master's fighting styles. His whole personality switches as we see the differences of everyone and enjoy all the fun the masters are having at each other's expense. Because of this, it's not just a clash of fighting styles, but also a clash of personalities that make everything so exciting. Whether it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, or a master and disciple tag team fight, or an all-out war where they have to take on soldiers and tanks, there was never a single arc in all 583 chapters that I was not excited and hyped for. I don't know if you understand how amazing and impressive that is. I cannot think of another long-running show that had this consistent quality to the story. For some context, the original Dragon Ball, from the introduction of Goku in Chapter 1 to the end of the Buu Saga where he flies away with Oob, was 519 chapters. But despite how much I love Dragon Ball, there's still a certain parts that I am, let's say, not as hyped for. Same with Yu Yu show, especially the entirety of the final arc. Same with many long-running shonen anime. Only Kenichi has kept me engrossed from cover to cover, adding more layers to make these interactions interesting. The variety of settings and circumstances the fights take place in. We've got standard one-on-ones, ambushes, two-on-one -on -one for both antagonists versus protagonists and vice versa, weapon versus weapon, weapon versus unarmed, Duel to the death between those who follow the path of the Killing Fist, Assault on building strongholds, Chaotic small-scale wars, Wrestling tag team matches, Jousting matches, Fights that take place in a dojo, At a pool, In rivers, On ships, On top of buildings, On the side of buildings, While riding in a helicopter, We mentioned collapsing stadiums, In jungles, we see allies fight allies, enemies fighting other enemies, taking a rocket ship to fight in the center of the sun itself. All right, I made the last one up, but the point is, I'm not even close to covering all the scenarios and locations in which combat takes place. The fight scenes and the respective surroundings may be top notch, but the philosophy that Kanichi gives us is also top tier. This is not because they give us answers to all the deep questions, but because they often don't. What even is strength? How am I supposed to heal someone's heart with a fist? What is my path? How can I walk it? These kinds of questions, in a variety of different ways, are abundant throughout the whole story. One of the more pivotal moments is when Kenichi loses a very important fight to someone he knew, and is told because his fist has no killing intent, he is weak. Kenichi is infuriated at this, and says in order to be able to get stronger, he needs to put more killing intent behind his fist. This crossroad sets up one of the major conflicts of the story. Those who follow the path of the Killing Fist versus those who follow the path of the Life Saving Fist. Kenichi is thrown in a situation where he is confronted with this choice and must choose. Another example in the manga is when Kenichi suffers a near-death experience, or to be more accurate, he did die facing an opponent before his masters brought him back to life. 
while his body recovered, his heart did not, and so he needs to go on a training arc to cure the wound of fear in his heart, a killer for any martial artist. These kinds of moments are archetypal for those who follow this path, and Kenichi manages to hit upon many of these moments, either through our main protagonists, or one of his allies, or even one of his enemies. Something that may eventually turn out to be contentious as the story progresses for people, the fan service. Kenichi has some stunningly beautiful women. Kenichi managed to capture their feminine charms without diving too heavy in over the top fan service. Around chapter 200, that changed, and they cranked it up to 11, where if there was a woman on screen, you can expect at minimum a panty shot, if not having the entirety of her clothes destroyed in every single fight. I'm personally in the less is more camp, where the occasional, unexpected, or even just implied fan service is enjoyed, but I'm not here to watch softcore hentai. Frankly, there were a lot of moments that were supposed to be edge of your seat, deathly moments, that ended up having some of its sting taken away as a very detailed bad shot takes sense of frame. Imagine if, during the scene where Frieza blows up Krillin, we see the shot from between Goku's legs and his pants were so tight we saw the outline of his balls. You can be pro fan service all you want, and god knows I enjoy the fan service of this early on, but it does take away from these serious moments, in my opinion. There are other criticisms to be laid on, ranging from mere opinion to objective problems. First up, one that's not really the show's fault. There was never an official English release of the manga, and as a result, we got some fan translations that were as bad as, well, an official English release. This, and the early artwork, is why I would recommend watching the anime and jumping into the manga where the anime ends. Some notable, nonsensical mistakes the early parts had were translating karate to martial arts, jujitsu into wushu, the name Loki, who is supposed to be named after the Norse god Loki, as the entire group consists of codenames from Norse mythology, is named Rocky. Even in the later parts you will find errors, such as a major event going by two different names depending on who translated that chapter. There was never one consistent translator, there was over a dozen at least, and sometimes you can very easily tell when the switches happened. Some of them thought it would be really funny to just make up their own sentences and put it in the manga, because funny. Others sometimes left speech bubbles blink, but none of these are really the fault of the show. At certain times, it's really difficult to suspend your disbelief, such as Kenichi's recovery time. He is able to go from hardly able to stand due to exhaustion to full power fighting at the speed of plot convenience. Other nitpicks I have are just how many supremely talented individuals just so happen to either go to the same school or go to an adjacent school without some big bad pulling the strings to make it happen. It's just a fun little coincidence. Sometimes whole plot points are either just kind of dropped or forgotten. For example, there was a scene post-anime where all the adjacent dojos came together and agreed they would now fight with our main cast, as they took on the evil forces that were coming for them all, and then we never hear from them again, they just vanish. This is surprising as this manga's story writing is pretty tightly woven, where some offhand comment can come back a few hundred chapters later. Other critiques? Aside from one character, every bad guy has a good guy underneath them, no matter how many they've already killed. All of this pales in comparison with the biggest problem this manga had, the ending. The ending wasn't bad, per se, but to say it was rushed would be an understatement. I don't know if there's any comparison that would really do it justice to encapsulate how out of nowhere it came, and how many plot threads were left unresolved, or how many got resolved out of nowhere. Imagine if, in Dragon Ball, you got to the episode where Cell absorbed Android 18 and began to change into his perfect form, and just as he is changing, you hear the announcer say that the entirety of Dragon Ball ends in two episodes. Gohan just got Super Saiyan, he's still in a time chamber with Goku, we have not seen what Trunks would do, what about Android 16, they somehow fit Majin Buu into all this, so Goku can fly off with Oob, it's kinda like that. The manga wasn't cancelled, but the author technically began working on the series in 1999, and after 15 years, he wanted to move on to another project, which is a shame for the rest of us. I still remember when I read the message at the end of one of the chapters, saying the manga was going to end in a few weeks. It did not even register in my mind that such a thing was a possibility, and that the translator was trying to be cute by messing with us all. I mean, they just opened like 6 new plot threads that will probably take another 50 chapters at least for us to resolve, but nope. We got an epilogue at least, so there was a definitive conclusion. It's been 10 years since it ended, and I can only hope we get some kind of History Strongest Disciple Kenichi Super that covers the time gap between the final chapter and the previous chapter, but it probably won't unfortunately. Now without some giant unexpected wave of resurged interest, between this and Vagabond, I really wish writers of such levels of talent could just finish their works. 
Despite these problems, however, there can be no doubt that, in the stage of martial arts anime and manga, there can be no one else who stands at the top of the mountain other than history's strongest disciple Kenichi. While the amount of competitors in this field are relatively small, it is at least jam-packed with strong contenders. Old contenders like Baki, new contenders like Record of Ragnarok, works that never got an anime adaptation like Vagabond, or works that practically became their own thing from the manga like Dragon Ball. Each of them have aspects in which they excel at, but none of them have so many aspects in which they excel at all at once. It saddens me that what should be the archetypal martial arts anime, in the same way Dragon Ball is the archetypal shonen battle anime, is hardly even recognized anymore, and never gained enough traction to even get an English manga release. This is the show that deserves to get the My Hero Academia, Demon Slayer, and Attack on Titan treatment, where the entirety of the manga needs to be made into a high quality anime. If you have not picked up this work, you can do so very easily. All 50 episodes of the English dub are on YouTube right now for you to watch, though I would still recommend the Japanese version, and I'll use only one example as to why. Apachai's character is that while he looks extremely imposing and could accidentally kill people with his massive strength, he's really just a big child, as indicated by his voice. How did the English dub capture this energy? <laughs> On second thought, I don't think I'll quit after all. Hmm? Oh, but Jay is so nice that he made you a walking cane! Putting that aside, I just wish to see Kenichi rise in popularity. It is my honest belief that it should be viewed as one of the all-time classics. When asked what is my favorite show, I always bounce between this, Dragon Ball, and Gurren Lagann. Speaking of which, I made a very popular video on Gurren Lagann, and a four-hour video on the epic of Dragon Ball. So if you like this video, I say you should go check those guys out as well. Share them and this video with people, as I wish my works to be seen by as many as possible, since views are not the only goal of this vid. Comment if you agree or disagree, what would you have put as the best instead? If you agree, what would you place as second place? Like the video, and don't forget to check out my website and buy yourself or others some delicious tea, because if you do, you will almost definitely probably find yourself a cute buck kicking love interest to hold hands with. Oh. And it'll ensure that I'll be able to make more videos like this, as the rate of videos I can make is directly connected to my finances. Subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time.